Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, October 10th, 2018. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week we're going to be talking about strange ice bikes on Europa. Uh, SLS has gotten a bad report card, problems with Hubble's gyro, big surprise. Uh, Blue Origin sending cargo to the moon and can moons have moons? Joining me this week, we've got I Choose You, uh, Dr. Paul M. Sutter. Hey, how's it going? We've also got uh, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Dr. Renberg. Hey, Fraser. Come on, camera switch to Morgan. Come on, you have to talk more. Am Morgan. I here? Yeah, there you go. All right. Universe, got... see me. <laughs> We've got... yes. Now the universe acknowledges your presence. We've got uh, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Hello, happy podcast day. Hey, it's podcast day. And joining us, special guest, Dr. Sean Carroll. Hi there, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, well, I, I think, I hope our special guest, uh, needs no introduction, but I'm still going to make you do it anyway. Uh, please tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Sean Carroll. I'm, uh, one of the two most famous Sean Carrolls in science. Uh, there's another one who's a biologist. We should make it the wrong one on the show today. You never, you never know. I've yeah. been invited and then uninvited to conferences because oh, they were no. looking for the other Sean Carroll. <laughs> There's a villa in Italy that I still would love to go to, but I'm not invited to. Yeah. But um, I'm a the physicist one. Uh, I'm a research professor at Caltech. I think about cosmology and gravity and quantum mechanics. And I also write books and I social media. And I recently started my own podcast. Uh, and that was really the the hook into why I wanted to have you come on the show because I stumbled my way onto the podcast. I'm trying to think where I heard about it. Oh, I was in like episode three, I think, and um, and I've been really enjoying it. It's sort of it's not what I would expect to come from a theoretical physicist but it is clearly someone you know sort of following your curiosity in some cases of theoretical physics but i mean you've had mike brown the uh, pluto killer you've had uh experts on poker and uh all kinds of of topics what convinced you to finally make the jump to doing a podcast um yeah i've been on various other podcasts and it always seemed like on the one hand it would be fun to have my own podcast on the other hand it seemed like it would be work and so that's always the uh, dividing, you know, the, the tension that you have to balance a little bit. Um, part of me thought, after having written a book about the Higgs boson, that my calling was as a scientist and an intellectual and a scholar, not as a journalist or interviewer. I was, I, I had to interview people for the Higgs boson book, and I, I, I didn't uh, do a great job at it. I'm married to Jennifer Roulette, who's a real interviewer, a real science journalist, so I know what it, it means to do it well. So I thought that if I was going to have a podcast, it would have to be just me talking, because I don't want to have any guests or anything like that. And that sounded like I would run out of things to say pretty quickly. But then I wrote this other book, The Big Picture, and there I was interviewing people not for sort of news stories, like, you know, what happened when the bird dropped a baguette into the Large Hadron Collider, but, you know, for more intellectual reasons, right? I was interviewing biologists about the origin of life and philosophers about the nature of consciousness, and that I really, really enjoyed. So, and I sort of missed it when the book was all done. I didn't have a license to sort of knock on people's doors and just ask them questions anymore. But it occurred to me after some friends prodded me in the right direction that if I had a podcast, I could just call people up and they would have to talk to me. It was like in the rules. And so far it's worked out pretty well. I managed to talk to people who I never otherwise would have had a chance to talk to. Uh, yeah, I think that that excuse to have fascinating conversations with people who are who you wouldn't run across in your everyday existence but now you've got this this sort of framework and this reason to call these people up and 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 talk to them and follow your curiosity is it's a you know i mean it's it's a time loved format and i really enjoy that process as well and i think you've got one that that matches the amount of i guess uh, time that you can commit to it <laughs> in that you're able to sort of, you know, it's a right. conversation and I, and yet it's a very, I, I mean, this is what we learned with astronomy cast. It's this very natural way to teach and to explain and to learn about things, to follow on with somebody who is engaged in the, in the subject. Um, how many episodes have you done now? 
Uh, we've had 17 episodes. I, I found that it was much more work than I expected to set it up. Yes. In terms of buying the equipment, getting the website, getting the host, all of that stuff. Um, but it's happily been equal to or even less than the amount of work I, I worried about to sort of keep it going. Um, you know, I, I have a conversation for an hour, an hour and a half, and then I do very minimal editing and it goes on the internet. I don't worry about video. That sounds too hard. Um, Let me know if you need help. It's not that hard. Video is very hard. I can't do it. Um, it's a mix of, uh, you know, in-person interviews and some remote interviews. And it's a, a very eclectic group. Like, it's not about physics, my podcast. Yeah. And people, I told people that. Some people don't believe it. But if you look at the people who are actually guests, you'll figure it out. Well, there are some people with, with physics. And, and you did one that was solo, if I recall correctly, where you just... Right. Just me talking. For yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I thought that was perfectly great too like like don't uh feel like you can't do that format as well because a lot of that worked really well where you just were talking about the origin of the of the universe and it was a fascinating you know you set the stage and you went down this path and i'm sure you've done many talks on this on this subject but it worked out great and i really enjoyed that as well as a sort of as both conversation good, and your yeah. own. I mean, so, that's very good to hear because I enjoy doing it and it is something I keep plan on doing. It's funny when I told Jennifer that I was going to do a solo version of the podcast, she, she says like, you can do that. <laughs> and yeah, I can do whatever I want. It's my podcast. I could, I could just recite poetry. You know, I could do a limerick day on the podcast if I wanted to, like I might not get many listeners, but I'm allowed to do whatever I want. It's a good feeling. It's not hosted by anybody. You know, it's not sponsored by anyone right now. I'm not even taking ads. I'm just, you know, asking for, Patreon support, so I'm not like having to read anything about mattresses or any anything like that. And maybe someday I will, but right now it's it's pretty low effort in terms of getting it out there. Um, so uh, I want to talk briefly about some some dream guests or some people that are coming up in the future, and then I want to shift gears and we can talk about uh, you know many universes. Sure. Who's coming? Who's coming up? I can't say that's a secret. You need to tune in, but uh, it's a surprise. I can tell you what kinds of people are coming up. Right. Um, I'm finally going to have real professional philosophers on the show. Like that was one of the things I hoped for and planned for from the start because I love philosophy myself. But um, the philosophers have been surprisingly reluctant to participate in this medium. It's very interesting. Scientists just love getting out there in front of the public and, and yammering about what we do. But uh, philosophers were a little bit uh, cagier, so I finally lured some in. Um, I have some film directors who have directed, well, I have a film director anyway, who's directed, you know, films you would will have heard of. Um, you know, I've had musicians, and I'm going for more musicians. Novelists. I had Annalee Newitz, who is a mm -hmm. science writer turned novelist, and I, I'm I'm thinking about more novelists, but that's a harder thing to do in the sense that, you know, if you haven't read any of their novels, would it be an interesting conversation, right? I think for the right people it would be, um, but I'll have to see. And I have a uh, I one of my secret ambitions is to have uh, chefs on the show. I want to talk about cooking. I want to get some architects and designers, and you know, just have a grand old time. That sounds good. Uh, now, when we were, like I said, when we were setting up this interview, uh, you were mentioning that you've been thinking a lot about uh, other universes and uh, w sort of what is uh, sort of in your mind right now. Yeah, so, well, it's very much in my mind because I'm completing the draft of a book that I'm working on that will be out in September next year um, called Something Deeply Hidden. And it's about quantum mechanics in general, but specifically about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. I think that a, there's, there's a couple of messages here. One is that within physics, within academic researchers, the whole field of foundations of quantum mechanics is not taken nearly as seriously as it should be. Um, and then with in the field of books about quantum mechanics, I think there's far too much, uh, you know, the genre of this is so mysterious, we'll never understand it. Who knows what's really going on? And I'm trying to be like, actually, we have really good theories about what's going on. We're not sure which one is right yet, but there's no insuperable barrier to actually understanding this. So I give a real sales pitch for the many worlds view, but I do uh, mention and try to give, you know, a, a fair accounting of the alternatives. Which of the alternatives is most interesting to you? I mean, I know that the search for 
uh, for inflation, like with the bicep two, you know, if, if, if that can turn up evidence of primordial gravitational waves, echoes of inflation, that leads to a very interesting ramification for the kinds of, of other universes that there could be. So, Cause I know it sort of by necessity demands other universes. What are some of the other ones that you're most fascinated by? Yeah, I think that the it's important to distinguish between different things that scientists mean when they use the phrase multiverse, because we're not at all consistent about this. Um, the thing that we'll learn about via inflation and gravitational waves is what we call the cosmological multiverse, which honestly doesn't even deserve the name. It's just the idea that really, really far away, way outside our observable horizon, conditions look very different like very different, like maybe different particles and forces and laws of nature and stuff like that. And this can be true in a large separate region of space that we would call another universe just for simple labels. But it's still connected to our universe. It's still part of the same space time. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is both more likely to be true than that. I give the cosmological multiverse 50-50 chance of being true. I give many worlds more than 90% chance of being true. But it's also much more dramatic, right? I mean, many worlds is the idea that when you observe a quantum system, an electron that can be spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, the conventional story says it's in a superposition of both until you look at it. And when you look at it, it suddenly changes. And now it's either spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, but not both. And many worlds says when you make that observation, the wave function of the universe branches into two copies, each describing a separate universe, one of which has the electron spinning clockwise and the other spinning counterclockwise. You can download an app for your iPhone that will split the universe in two. If you're facing a tough decision and don't know what to do, you can ask it, you know, like, should I have pepperoni or sausage on my pizza? And then there will be a whole universe in which you had the pepperoni pizza and a whole universe in which you had the sausage pizza. And, uh, and, you know, to place 90% odds on it, that's, that's pretty significant. That's what gives you that level of confidence. Well, you know, not everyone agrees to be very, very clear. There are, there are alternatives that other people uh, would put 90% or more confidence on, but the, the secret of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is that it's not, you take quantum mechanics and add in a whole bunch of extra worlds. Rather, you take quantum mechanics and remove all the weird rules about observations and collapsing of wave functions and just say, there's a wave function. It evolves smoothly, deterministically, according to the Schrodinger equation, always. The universes, the extra worlds, they were always there in quantum mechanics. It's just the conventional versions of quantum mechanics get rid of them somehow by collapse of the wave function. And many worlds says, let's allow them to be there. It says, if you believe an electron can be in a superposition of spinning clockwise and spinning counterclockwise, then you should believe that you can be in a superposition of having seen the electron spin cl clockwise and having seen the electron spin counterclockwise. And why not the whole universe being in a superposition? Many worlds just lets that happen. So it's by far the simplest, purest, most direct way of dealing with what we see when we do quantum experiments. And do you feel like were any closer to being able to prove any of them through experimentation? Well, it's, it's an extraordinarily falsifiable theory, many worlds. If you ever observe the wave function to do anything other than what the Schrodinger equation says, you have falsified the theory. And there are, in fact, other models in which the wave function usually obeys Schrodinger's equation, but not always. It spontaneously collapses all by itself. That's an experimentally distinguishable theory, and people are doing those experiments as we speak. It's, but it's hard, right, to to falsify and falsify and falsify, you know, whatever you're left with, no matter how bizarre, must be true. But it's hard to then say, even though I've falsified every other possibility, and it's still, or or it's it is held up to every attempt to falsify. It's still hard to make that final leap to say. It's, yeah, it's because real. that's okay. Science yeah. never makes that final. <laughs> no, I know, leap, right? I know. Science never supposed to say we're 100% sure that this idea is right. We just say, you know, we tried all the ideas. The other ones look worse and worse the more data we collect. This one looks better and better. So at some point it becomes so good that we get on with our lives. Like we're still testing special relativity, 
right? We're still doing experimental tests of all of our favorite theories. So of course, we'll always do that with many worlds or anything else. But at some point, you say, let's provisionally accept this and work on how to make it actually help with applications. And to travel to them and explore them and, you know, experience all the lifetimes that we never could have seen. But that's, you know, perhaps a science fiction novel. Sadly, you can't visit the other worlds, but you can put the theory to work. I mean, the last part of my book is how taking many worlds seriously helps us understand the emergence of gravity and space time from quantum mechanics, which is something people have been working on for many, many decades now. Uh, John, gotta let you go. But uh, once again, um, where can people find your podcast and what's it called? So the podcast is called Mindscape. I have a website, which is preposterousuniverse.com. And if you just go there, there's a link at the top that says podcast, or you can go preposterousuniverse.com slash podcast. But the best way to just Google Sean Carroll podcast or Mindscape podcast, and you'll get right there. And most importantly, how to, and people to support what you're doing, patreon.com slash yeah, Sean M. Carroll, M for Michael. Yep. Uh, but, you know, again, there's links to that yep. on the podcast webpage. It's it's really been quite heartwarming, actually, the fact that I'm getting uh, support on Patreon. I wasn't sure anyone would support it. Um, it pays for the microphones and for getting transcripts of each episode and stuff like that. Uh, and... I do, you know, monthly Ask Me Anything shows just for the Patreons. Yeah. And uh, last, this week I did a, <laughs> a two and a half hour uh, Ask Me Anything. So my voice was completely gone by the end of it. But I hope that people liked it. Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Really appreciate it. Good luck with everything you do. Uh, I'll keep uh, mentioning the podcast to everyone who will listen. And, uh, and I can't wait to hear who uh, shows up next. All right. Thank you very much. Have fun talking about the planets and the moon. We will. We will. All right. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. All right. Before we're going to move on to the rest of our show, I want to take a moment and thanks, as always, our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the community of people who uh, produced the show, brought in the guest. Zero did it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and uh, talk about some of the uh, topics we're going to talk about in the show, and we couldn't do this without them. So go to wshcrew.space, and, uh, and they will give you all the instructions to sign up. And it is even more critical now because Google Plus is getting shut down. Wah, wah. And the, if you follow the history, the Weekly Space Hangout crew came together on Google Plus. They created a community when we went on hiatus, and use that as a place to keep each other entertained over the summer while we were on hiatus every summer. And now that is going away. So it's more important than ever if you're watching this, if you joined the community and you just never got around to, to joining the Weekly Space Hangout crew at their own website, take a moment, go there, sign up, so they have your email address and can contact you to sort of keep you involved in, in everything that's going on. So, uh, all right, let's move on to the show, the topics this week. Uh, Kimberly, let's talk about the Space Launch System. Sure. So I'm here today to report to you that, just like James Webb, another one of NASA's projects is 100% totally on time and under budget. That's great. <gasps> awesome. Yeah. Uh, next story. Uh, uh, yeah, no. Uh, I, I was lying. Mm. Well, a sarcasm. A sarcasm, yeah. not lying. So, so the Space Launch System. I don't like your jokes. <laughs> sorry. My yeah. jokes are depressing and based in reality. That's how it works. That's why they're funny. <laughs> so the Space Launch System has been in development for quite a while and has been delayed and over budget for quite a while as well. And just uh, this week, NASA's Inspector General uh, released a report investigating what's going on, why is it delayed, why is it over budget, what are the new projections for when it'll be finished and ready to launch? Uh, so <clears throat> the report came back. It's not good. Uh, the space launch system is now estimated to be completed three years after it was first anticipated to be completed and will be twice as expensive as originally estimated. And the inspector general puts pretty much all of that blame on Boeing, who is developing the space launch system. And... They essentially said, Boeing, you've done, what was it, three months of work in a year and a half, and you've still gotten 90% of your bonuses? What's going on? This isn't cool. And Boeing said, 
Rockets are complicated. We had no idea this would take a while. Rockets are really difficult. And the inspector general said, uh, yeah, that's not a good, that's not a good enough excuse. This is unacceptable. And so it's not a really good projection, especially right after the James Webb report came back saying a very similar situation with uh, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin, is that right? Uh, Northrop, Grumman. Did, Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman sorry. was the ones that's working the one. on the James Webb. Sorry, yeah. Northrop Grumman, thank you. Uh, and so that's another really bad report for another NASA contractor doing another really big mission that has been promised for a really long time. It's surprising to me to see how similar the budgets are on the two projects. So James Webb cross pass is what, $8.6 billion? SLS is up in the 11 it's and 11, half? It's almost $12 billion Almost $12 now. billion. Dollars. Almost $12 so billion. Clearly is and more the... than half of that is uh, for Boeing developing these two uh, cores. Now, Morgan, before we started the show, you mentioned that um, <laughs> that being this late still entitles people to their to their to their bonuses you were hoping for a gig like that kimberly mentioned this but i just i couldn't believe this part of the report when they laid out a schedule uh in 2016 about sort of the way they were going to progress and 21 months later they're 18 months behind schedule um and i think the comparison to james webb is is interesting but there's one really important difference between SLS and James Webb. And that's that there's nobody else out there building competitors to James Webb. If we sit around on our hands for 15 years or five years, there aren't gonna be other James Webbs appearing in space. If we sit around our hands on our hands for five years, let alone two years, there could be competitors in one form or another to uh, to SLS. And so the fact that they're slipping behind isn't just relative to their schedule, but relative to all their competitors. And it, if they slip enough, eventually it's going to sort of obviate the need for the system at all, which really isn't the case for, for James Webb or, or other like big science projects like that. Sure. And I mean, SpaceX developed the Falcon Heavy, which is admittedly smaller and slightly less complicated, but for half a billion dollars. So when you scale the, the, the Falcon Heavy capability and the cost to what SLS will do, it doesn't, it really doesn't match, it doesn't scale up properly. Yeah, and actually, I would say that the SLS is in the exact same boat as James Webb. Uh, you're right that there are no competitors for large infrared space-based telescopes, but there are competitions for telescopes in general. Mm -hmm. And time and attention spent by grad students and faculty and postdocs, uh, a grad student who's just starting out can't wait around for the James Webb to fly to write their thesis. And a faculty member or researcher who needs, needs to write a grant and keep getting work done and interesting science done, can't wait around forever for James Webb to fly. They will, the community will find, funnel money to more ground-based missions or new kinds of searches that don't rely on uh, on either routing around the hole that James Webb is leaving or just <clears throat> focusing on different kinds of astronomy. And in both cases with the SLS and James Webb, I keep scratching my head, just, just what is going wrong? Like there, there looks like there is like massive systematic failure for these large scale flagship type missions that NASA is supposed to be leading. We, when we were at the Cape uh, on our Astro Tour, we got a chance to actually go and tour around some of the new hardware that's being built. And it mm -hmm. is, it is just at a scale that just boggles the imagination. I mean, we saw the mobile transporters there mm -hmm. and we were able to come around the, the side of the vehicle assembly building and we could see the parts of the of the SLS in construction sort of peeking through the the side of the of the building and the enormous gantry that the whole thing is going to be using it is <clears throat> it's such a big operation that it it's like it doesn't feel like it's that surprising that it's taking longer and that it's over budget and when you look at the 
at the capacity, right? The the block one is expected to do 95 tons to low Earth orbit, fully expendable. And as you mentioned, the Falcon Heavy is up to 54 tons in full expendable mode. So that's, I mean, it's half, but it's getting closer, right? And so, yeah, the- Half for a 20th the cost. For a 20th the cost, right? And so then you start to think about things like on-orbit construction, smaller modules, like, there's a lot of other ways to, to go at that. And I, I think that is definitely something that that they're going to have to be really concerned about is the but Can the I offer a glimmer of hope? Uh, and it's maybe less hope for SLS and more hope for James Webb. And that's like if we crank our minds back to like 1987, uh, NASA had a huge boondoggle on their hands you know a project that was incredibly over budget and over schedule and something that wasn't clear it was going to fly ever uh and then eventually flies and doesn't work and what today we know that that today we know that that's uh the hubble space telescope which we'll talk more about momentarily uh but has proven itself after that whole process to be one of the most important and successful scientific experiments ever deployed. Um, and so just because things are going poorly doesn't necessarily mean the outcome will be bad, but it, it does, as Paul was mentioned, call into question sort of what the systemic problem is that isn't just affecting one project, but is sort of categorically affecting these large scale uh, pro projects that NASA is commissioning through the aerospace companies. So, All right. Wah, wah. <laughs> wah, wah. There All right. You go. Well, let's move on. Uh, now I want to talk. Speaking of uh, Hubble <laughs> and its uh, gyro problem, what's wrong with Hi with the Hubble's gyro? Hubble looks like it's losing a gyro, <laughs> which uh, it uses these gyroscopes to stabilize itself so it can point very, very accurately at a very precise target for long periods of time. And you need multiple gyroscopes to keep it redundant, to keep it precise. And if Hubble loses, if it were to lose all of its gyroscopes, which it started with six, if it lost all of them, then it just wouldn't be able to point, which means it can't really do astronomy even anymore. Even though the mirror works, the lenses work, all the instruments work, uh, if you can't point and stare at something for a long time in space, you're not really doing astronomy anymore. So the, it has uh, two sets of gyros. Three of them are relatively newer and three of them are relatively older. This one that just failed is one of the older ones. And it was, this is not exactly a surprise. It had been reported for the past year that was starting to glitch, starting to malfunction. They are trying to get it back online. NASA is, but, uh, they're not entirely confident. It's okay if the Hubble loses this gyroscope. It still has a couple more that it can still use to do the whole astronomy thing. But it means if more continue to fail, then maybe we should think about, I don't know, launching a replacement. So my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we often conflate reaction wheels with gyroscopes. And my understanding here is that there are still enough reaction wheels, which are used to physically turn the spacecraft, mm -hmm. but the gyroscopes are used to measure that turn. And so given a particular orientation, Hubble can still sort of hold that station sort of at the same level it could before, but will be less certain about exactly where it's looking because the gyroscopes won't be able to measure sort of the change in rotation as it's happening as smoothly as before. Because they were saying that it could get down to one gyroscope and still be functional. And I don't think it could get down to one reaction wheel and still be functional as we saw with Kepler. Am I like totally off base here? Whoa. No, so no, no. Go, I just go found ahead, an answer on, the, you just blew my mind. 
I had no idea. So um, Robert Frost, instructor and flight controller at NASA, says both are used for attitude control. Both are heavy flywheels. Both work by creating a torque through changing their momentum. Reaction wheels spun, up or spun down to create the torque and force the vehicle to rotate, while a, a, a momentum wheel is always spinning at very high speed, and that creates the stabilization of the spacecraft. It's like 17,000 RPM or something Resistant huge. to changing its attitude. So the reaction wheels are the ones that are turning it to new directions, and the momentum wheels, the ones that are are constantly spinning to keep it in place. I, I had no idea. I'm just like I literally I I had totally been conflating the two things. So thank you, Morgan. So Paul, if we get down to one gyroscope on Hubble, <clears throat> what sort of the loss of precision we're talking about? I I honestly don't know. That I feel like, like a hard question. Sorry. It's, it's a I, I, no. It's it's a really it's a really important question. Is uh, I'm very sure that some kinds of observing scenarios will no longer be possible if we're down to one gyroscope. Like I don't think there'd be any more deep fields from it, or you know, just anything that requires a very very long stare for very long periods of time. And. Uh, like Morgan said, you know, the, and Fraser said that the reaction wheels can still turn the thing, so we can still target, but uh, we're going to lose that precision as the gyroscopes go down. And and if I understand the one of the gyros went offline, they brought the, the as you said they the lo they lost the last of the old ones, but the new ones had been installed by the good folks by the good astronauts. Um, and there are higher technology, new technology, and they tried to bring one of them online and it wasn't performing the way they wanted. So now they're turning it off, turning back on again, I think is yeah. classic. So, so we have two definitely good gyroscopes. And my understanding is if the situation sort of rests on two gyroscopes, the plan is to turn one off and operate in one gyroscope mode, which will restrict both some kinds of observations, but also some parts of the sky that they'll be able to look at. But the expectation is once we sort of acclimate to this more limited um, spectrum of, of possibilities for Hubble, we'll be able to basically use it twice as long. And uh, how long we'll is able... that? I think it depends on sort of that half-life of uh, those uh, gyroscopes, which sounds like it was three and 25 years, uh, doesn't seem like a real bad, uh, bad place to be in. It, it's certainly kind of a developing situation and they're, they're trying to figure out yeah. which yeah, pieces I, are in light. Not as problematic as Kepler losing its reaction wheels. Just determined to make me sad tonight, aren't you? <laughs> well, it's, but NASA is saying don't panic. So please don't panic, Kimberly. I'm not panicking. I'm just crossing my fingers that Hubble will last until the other one that we're not naming launches. <laughs> On the well, and K right. two, the extended Kepler mission, once the reaction wheels failed, still did lots of cool science. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the the takeaway here is Hubble will continue to be useful. It just will be useful for different kinds of things than before. And because Hubble was, you know, 10 times oversubscribed, eliminate the 30% or whatever of stuff that now it's not useful for, and you still have more first rate research waiting to be done on it than can possibly be accommodated. Bill Sugden is noting in the comments, I feel sorry for all those observers that had time booked. What happens? I mean, you just get put to the end of the schedule? Do they shuffle everybody down on the schedule? How does that kind of thing work? I don't know. I've never, never had, had Hubble time. <laughs> never had Hubble time. Astronomers are used to it. Astronomers are used to this kind of thing. You get scheduled, even especially ground based. Clouds. You get scheduled. Yeah. You get clouds. Yeah. There's instrument failures. There's little minor instrument failures, even with space based telescopes, all the time. And it's just part of the game. Yeah. Clouds. That's the thing you don't have to deal with space with Hubble. Clouds. Space clouds. Yeah. When Hubble's looking at clouds, it's probably not so great then, anymore then you really know your gyroscopes are out <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right well uh take care hubble uh we're we're hoping you get through this and last forever all right let's move on um morgan 
Let's talk about these strange uh, structures that could exist on Europa and cause a problem for landers. Is Europa a cactus? <laughs> we can't be sure it's not. So this is some really cool work that um, combined, I think, probably two techniques that are very, very rarely used. Uh, one was radi radar observations from Earth, which I'm presuming was made using Arecibo, although that's not stated anywhere in the press release. Uh, and two were uh, thermal infrared observations of the surface of Europa made by the Galileo spacecraft, which orbited Jupiter in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And in fact, uh, Galileo, uh, the spacecraft is responsible for essentially everything we know about Europa. Um, it made the observations with the magnetometer that indicated that there might be a liquid water ocean. It made most of the pictures that are used to make the surface maps of Europa. And now this thermal data is being combined with radar information um, from Earth to reveal that Europa might have a feature called, I'm going to say penitentes, 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 Pen penitentes uh, that is also observed here on Earth. And they're kind of like ice spikes. Uh, and so the way this works is if you have an icy surface and you have sun bearing down on that surface through little imperfections in the surface, parts of the ice will start to melt faster than others. Maybe there's a speck of dirt that absorbs more heat, melts that little area down. But instead of melting into water in space, it sublimates away, uh, which means it goes straight from a solid to a gas. Um, and this is key because it can then be redeposited somewhere else on the surface, rather than kind of just filling up the hole where it melts and, and staying there. Uh, and then as these little holes form, they act as sort of like focusing plates for more sunlight. And sun tends to sort of reflect off the edges of the spikes down into the gaps, depositing heat into the gaps, sublimating away that, uh, that ice and deepening the gaps between the spikes. And so you, you get this reinforcing effect. And on Earth, wind also starts to go between the spikes and helps excavate them. Uh, through the Bernoulli effect, but on Europa, where there's no atmosphere, that's not such, uh, such an issue. Um, on Earth, these things tend to form kind of in pretty dense clusters and can be as much as five meters high. On Europa, yeah, that's five pretty big. Five meters you know, these high. Are like five, yeah, I think more commonly they're, you know, less than a meter, centimeters high, but they can form up to five meters high. On Europa, uh, which benefits from having basically very consistent uh, sun angle. You know, because Jupiter is so far away, it's moving relative to the sun, not very much in any given day. And so the sun is beating down on, on Europa pretty consistently, which reinforces sort of the same areas. Like on Earth, as the sun changes over the course of the day, the rays of light are hitting at different angles, and it kind of averages out some of this effect. But it's very concentrated on Europa, and so you can get spikes that are up to they suggest up to 15 meters high. Uh, and each spike would be about seven, seven and a half meters apart. So these are more like giant ice javelins than, than like porcupine spikes or, or something like that. Um, so Paranor uh, just posted in the comments, it's beautiful. He said, uh, attempt no landing. Of course, the quote mm -hmm. from Arthur C. Clarke, it's not any philosophical reasons. It's just it's dangerous. Don't try. There's big spikes. <laughs> just, so can I, I'm going to ask the obvious, can I ask the obvious question. How do you rove across that? So you ask the Hayabusa land. Don't. <laughs> um, yeah, Hayabusa so it. Their, their observations indicate that the spikes, if they exist, are probably more likely to be found around the equator than near the poles because the sun strikes the equator more directly then it strikes the poles, which would magnify this effect. Uh, now, fortunately, the areas that we're probably interested in studying on Europa are not so much near the equator, but especially in the Southern Hemisphere, because this is where Hubble and Herschel have detected possible evidence of geysers on, on Europa. But this, I think this sort of draws into relief sort of the reason that you don't try to land on something that you've really never seen. The whole point of the Europa Clipper, which should launch hopefully in the early 2020s, uh, was originally to kind of do a meter scale survey of the surface of 
Europa with the anticipation of a f using making maps that could then be used to target a future lander. Um, however, Congress has mandated that the Europa Clipper carry a lander on this early 2020s mission. And that's kind of a problem if you don't know where to land. You know, if this work hadn't been done and these ice pack spikes actually do prove to be true, we could have dropped this lander on Europa only to have it impaled on an ice spike and, you know, never hear from it again. And we'd think maybe the lander broke, but really it just landed in a bad place. So we don't want to get our steps out of order here. We need to map the surface first, identify if these features actually exist. And if they do, find areas where they don't and target our lander there. I, I think the Soviets, when they were exploring Venus, went the other way, where they just sent lander after lander, just watched how they died, and then tried to make a lander that wouldn't die that way. So I think there's a perfectly reasonable approach to still go with the don't feel, don't need to understand it, just watch how your rover dies, and then- It's a little quicker to get to Venus than lander. Jupiter. Yeah, I, I was guess. just gonna make a Soviet joke, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if the lander tries to turn around and return, it gets shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if there's anything that Western society in the 21st century is looking to do, is definitely emulate Soviet Russia. <laughs> All right. Um, well, can't, sorry, can't Europa missions. This is a really depressing episode. <laughs> wow. Real bummer. I mean, I'm gonna, lift us I've up here, Fraser. Bummers. I've got some good news. You ready? Here we go. Uh, yeah. So with the most recent uh, International Astronautical Conference that was held, uh, 69th Annual Astronautical Congress in Germany on Tuesday, uh, Blue Origin announced that they had signed a deal with a couple of German aerospace companies to send uh, cargo to the moon as early as 2023. So, uh, of course, it's Blue Origin, so we have literally no details. Um, but the uh, the information is that there's this thing called the <laughs> they don't talk about what the Blue Moon they call it the Blue Moon mission. They don't know what it's going to be, um, but there is this what looks like sort of this new effort to send cargo to the moon the the europeans have been planning have been talking quite a bit about building a potential moon colony a moon village i believe is what they called it so it could be that this is some part of it um and some of the interesting parts of this for example is that they're going to be uh they mentioned they're going to be using the new glenn of course the new glenn is the is the follow-on rocket to the new shepherd it's the competition to the um to the to the Falcon Heavy, potentially, a fairly large reusable bottom stage, disposable upper stage. And again, when Paul and I were in uh, Florida, we got to drive right pa past the new Blue Origin uh, factory where they're building them. It's a very big building, a very secret, large building where I'm sure magical rockets are being created inside. So it just shows that, you know, week after week, we're always talking about what SpaceX is up to and we live in Elonian years. But in theory, this other rocket company that the richest man on earth is spending a billion dollars of his own personal revenue every year to fund that has done many reusable launches of their smaller stage is getting set to take on the orbital launch market and potentially even be able to send cargo to the moon so don't don't count them out yet how, how does our that... luck they'll ac accidentally drop it right on apollo 11. <laughs> and the and the other part that's interesting as well in, within the last couple of weeks is that uh, it's sort of been made official that the United Launch Alliance, which is a combination of a bunch of rocket companies we've already mentioned, uh, is has chosen the Blue Origin engine, the BE-4, as their choice for their new Vulcan rocket. And the Vulcan is going to be a methane rocket, which is interesting. Um, going to use this the BE-4 as a pretty fascinating again like another way for them to get into the launch market is to sell these these rocket engines to other companies and that's a way to bootstrap up as opposed to selling full launches which is the way that the spacex has gone it makes a ton of sense to send to sell some of the smaller parts where companies are having trouble fulfilling that right now most of the large american rockets 
are using Russian rocket engines. And so to actually have an American rocket engine that they can choose from is a pretty enticing uh, possibility for them. So, so who knows, 2023, uh, we may be Bezonian years. We may need to come up with another term for that, but it's so, kind of amazing. So I have a question that... about this. Uh, so the so Blue Origin is going to bring cargo to the moon, commercial, assuming, you know, cargo. And the Outer Space Treaty says that no one's allowed to own private property in space. So is this legal? <laughs> um, so the, the Outer Space Treaty is was of course created in 1967 to stop the nuclear really the, the nuclear proliferate proliferation in space and a big part of it was really it was all about preventing nuclear weapons being put in space no weapons of mass destruction whatsoever because you have essentially a zero deployment time you you put a nuke in space you float it over your enemy cities that the you press one button and that city goes away and there's no warning time and and so they wanted to be able to have the the old proper warning time of nine however many minutes they have right now before the nuclear uh, warheads drop on you so, so they're sure, less there's, specific about there's, there's the part ownership. of it though that says yeah. that that countries are responsible for uh, corporations within their borders. <clears throat> abiding yeah. by the treaty as well yeah so, so the way that can, works is they that do this? if you um if if you have it, it's treated like antarctica so all of outer space is for the shared uh of, of all is for shared for all humanity and so if you build a research station for example on the surface of the moon you have to make that research station freely available to anyone who wants to who can actually reach it and get in do, your doors you can't turn anybody away and so you and can't necessarily company own anything, but at the same time, there's no real, and this is where people are looking at the, at the asteroid mining, there's no rules against harvesting resources from, from the moon and, and, and from other, from asteroids and, and things like that. And you can imagine like, what is, what is asteroid Bennu? Uh, what is the OSIRIS-REx mission doing, right? It's, it's harvesting resources from an asteroid for the scientific benefit of a earth-based uh, science agency. So, so it's a very gray area. Uh, right now, there's actually a lot of modifications were recently made by Congress to really encourage asteroid mining in general. So, so right now, it's an open frontier. As long as you don't put nukes on the moon, you don't build nuclear reactors on the moon, you don't train your nuclear powered super soldiers on the moon, then right now it's all sort of fair. Don't build an army of nuclear super soldiers on the moon. You can build them here on Earth, but not on the moon. And you can build no. regular super soldiers on the moon, but no not nuclear No armies of Captain ones. America on the moon. It's all about nuclear. So. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? No one has any other comments about uh, Blue Origin? All right, well, let's, let's, uh, let's wrap Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Let's see That's if it all happens. I got to say. I just, I want to see a new comfort. Launch. There is comfort. As Sean is right, there is another universe completely inaccessible to us where the SLS is on time and under budget. James Webb is already up. Hubble is still kicking along with all its gyroscopes. And Blue Origins is shuttling people to the Bigelow Habitat Space Hotel. And the superconducting super cool collider to live there. Uh, is operating yeah. at full steam. Sounds yeah. nice. Yeah, sounds, I like that. I like that all too. Bad that's inaccessible to us and forever will be locked from this <laughs> womp, world. Womp, womp. All right. Uh, time to. Uh, oh, so let's. We've got a couple more minutes. Let's have a, a brief conversation about can moons have moons? Yes. Did anyone yes. want to take this on? Moons can have moons. Sure. Why not? Yeah. All right. So there was an article going around the internet this week about someone actually did the math about moons have moons and that there are certain you know like I've, I've, I've done a video on this people have asked me this question all the time uh, the and if someone did the math and the answer is yes in some certain situations but there's nothing here in the solar system what would you call the moon of a moon moon squared moon squared um, morgan moonlet moonlet moon? a tune a tune 
Dune. Um, <laughs> that I like. A Dune. Dune. <laughs> Moonception. People in the chat are starting to throw some uh, suggestions there. I think no, they went up with it's... Moon Moon. It's totally doable. I mean, just think of a star that has a planet, a single planet that has a moon, and scale that system down. Sure. Planet, moon. So how, little or moon. like, this is one of those, like, folding paper things where you can't fold a piece of paper seven times. How many iterations of this can you have before you, like, get to the Planck scale and it, it's over? I think yeah, that's it. Yeah, it depends on the dynamical, it depends on the mass ratios of everything. I think that's the very critical parameter for stability. And so, yeah, if if you need very big mass ratios, you, like your, your tune has to be very, very small in order to be allowed in a stable orbit, then... Your thrun isn't going to work. Your thrun... Oh, this, okay, <laughs> your throne might be just a speck of dust. <laughs> um, what about the foon? This is, we're just going to stop, okay? Yeah. I can't really take it anymore. Um, so the, uh, the, I think one of the only ones that's possible. Oh, so all the giant planets were possible, but... You need to have a really special situation, and it, and it really does appear that there are no moons of moons because none of the main moons are outside, are in the range where they could have moons, but and none have been discovered. So far. some so moons do have shepherd moons in the solar system. I think that's certainly true at Saturn, which is sort of a special case of that. That's a shroom. <laughs> Oh, but sort of harking back to last week when we were talking about an exomoon, that situation actually is one that would work potentially. And that Exotune? Jupiter Exotune. Exotune. <laughs> and that that planet exomoon combo is in its star's habitable zone. So if the Jupiter sized planet with the Neptune sized moon has a an... Her size, size her two. size two. What size words two. am I saying now? Okay, so <laughs> what I think words are you making me say, Morgan? This is terrible. If there's one thing that we have to make from this conversation, it's to make that term tune stick. Can we not? I like it. Really, I really, really can not. We I will not. You're doing astronomy cast on it, and it's done. T I will o -O become a cosmologist if you make me say that word seriously. T O O N. Is that? Are we clear? That's the spelling, Morgan. Tune. Is that right? T O O N. That's yeah. what I was thinking. All right. We Perfect. put a silent G in there. And then a thun. If it's a, if it's a moon of a moon of a moon. Yeah, a thun. A thun. Yeah, that one's obvious. Okay. All right. I, there see, it is. See, tune. So I've as you probably know, um, David Dickinson and I, uh, co-author on the Universe Today Ultimate Guide Viewing the Cosmos, um, has uh, he's been trying to pitch the concept of mini moon, which is the opposite of the super moon. And people are coming with alternate terms. We're seeing the term take hold, which is very satisfying because I, we've been just like pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And so I think <laughs> tune is the next, is the next one. We can, we can make this, we can make this stick. It's going to happen. Morgan, this is for you. Protest. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Protest. All right. Uh, as we wrap things up, I would love to uh, have people let us know what they're working on. Morgan, what are you doing? As we speak, I am writing a pitch for tunes uh, for <laughs> SciShow Space. But yes! in the interim, one month to forever between me writing this and it actually existing, you can check out some of the cool videos we've put but up recently. But you are going to use the one... term in the video, right? <laughs> I just put up one. Uh, uh, they just put up one of mine yesterday uh, about some neat mysteries of of Uranus, including one about uh, its awesome moon Miranda. So check that out. Kimberly. So uh, recently uh, I've been looking at all the awesome missions that are going to asteroids in the near future. And then I'm also looking at uh, going to Mercury with Bepi Colombo, which I'm very excited yes. for. Yes, so you can read all about that on eos.org. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm really excited about that mission. I've been so seeing excited for ESA Beth stacking it up, getting it ready for launch. Uh, so yep. great for them to go back to to Mercury. About Paul. Time. 
Uh, so as everyone knows, I love working with artists to explain difficult science concepts. And for the past few months, I've been working with Siren Modern Dance based out of New York on a new project called TikTok, all about the nature of time. And they're actually coming to Columbus in a couple of weeks for a week long workshop. We're going to have a work in progress showing uh, and at the end of the week. So go to my website, pmstarter.com for links of how to get access to that showing if you live near Columbus. And we will have a premiere the first weekend of December in New York at the Alvin Ailey Studios. And again, my website there has all the links. Awesome. That's uh, so cool. All right. Well, I, of course, I'm just going to shamelessly self-promote again. Near for today, Ultimate Guide, Viewing the Cosmos. Pre-order now. Here's the weird part. Um, it's you can pre-order in the United States for only eighteen ninety nine, while the regular price is twenty eight ninety nine. I don't know why. I don't know if this is only going to last up until the point the book goes on sale on October twenty third. So if you were wanting an excuse to pick it up, and it's beautiful color pictures, look at this. Oh, you've never seen these pictures before. Uh, check it out from Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, other places where fine books are sold. All right, let's uh, wrap things up. Thanks, everybody. Uh, a big, again, a reminder. Thank you to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Uh, if, the, if the original Google Plus community mattered to you, remember, Google Plus is about to shut this down, so you're going to want to move to the more new official WSHcrew.space, and they will take good care of you. Um, let me push to this view. And apparently I shut it down really quickly for Astronomy Cast, and people thought I was what had happened. So, like, we're going to say goodbye, and then we're just going to stand there and wait for a little while, and then people can tell me uh, when it got shut down. So thanks, everybody. Bye. We'll see you all next week. <laughs> and Do you keep waving? Just keep waving. Just keep waving.